Thank you for everyone who registered and is present in this event today. This event is in collaboration with Mark Wadsworth and his publisher, People Tree Press, in commemoration of Mahatma Gandhi's birthday, which is a national holiday in India. Mahatma Gandhi was a lawyer, politician, social activist and a writer. Gandhi became the leader of the nationalist movement against the British rule of India through his pioneering strategy of nonviolence. He inspired the thinking of many world leaders, including Martin Luther King, in America and South Africa's Nelson Mandela. Shortly after India gained independence in 1947, Gandhi was assassinated on the 30th of January, 1948. And the United Nations declared October 2nd as the International Day of Nonviolence to honor Gandhi's life. Today, I'm joined by Mark Wadsworth, a British black rights activist and journalist, award-winning writer, broadcaster and BBC filmmaker. Our event today fittingly takes place on the 151st anniversary of Indian father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi. Mark founded the Anti-Racist Alliance, which went on to become the largest Black-led movement in Europe. He helped the parents of murdered Black teenager Stephen Lawrence set up their justice campaign. Mark directed and produced the film Divided by Race, United in War and Peace in 2013, a moving documentary about race relations in Britain during and after the Second World War. It exposes sometimes, sometimes painful evolution of a multicultural society from the unique vantage point of black and white veterans. He was producer of the remake of the film. So um, I'll just begin off by, begin by welcoming Mark. Hi Mark, um, Hi. thank you for joining us today. My pleasure, uh, Robert. Um, and thank you for agreeing to discuss the book Comrade Sack, a political biography. Um, we're in, I guess, very fitting times to discuss, I guess, um, an array of issues that um, have come to light over the years, um, but particularly during, I guess, these dread times um, that we're all kind of going through. Wadsworth's Comrade Sack, a political biography, charts Shapoji Saklavala's movement from privileged Parsi beginnings as a member of the mega rich Tata dynasty to revolutionary communists. It examines his quarrel with Gandhi over goals and tactics of the Indian, Indian independence movement and Saklavala's not so easy relationship to the communist international. Above all, the study documents his role in a radical phase of British labour politics and the traditions of local activism and municipal socialism, which made his Battersea North constituency such a welcoming home. Drawn from his speeches and writings, Saklavala's passionate and radical voice speaks clearly to our times. When left-wing politics is in retreat, his words and life serve to remind us that the goals of ending inequality and making possible human liberation are too important to be consi consigned to forgotten history. This comprehensively revised 2020 edition replaces the 1998 publication. Um, so I want to get stuck in today's event right away, Mark. Um, um, so let's begin by talking about the revisions of the second edition and what main themes are covered in the second edition. The first edition was published in 1998. So let's discuss some of the new themes in the book. The first edition was predicated, I would say, pretty much on talking about colonialism, yes, talking about anti-imperialism, talking about Saklat Vala's role in raising these issues, uh, not just in the wider movement, but in the Communist Party itself, trying to get the Communist Party of Great Britain to prioritize the anti-colonial struggle, particularly the uh, fight for Indian independence, uh, which it didn't see as the pro its primary concern. It was mainly concerned with a Eurocentric, worldview, uh, talking about um, the fight of the industrial white working class. And you see that today, that some leftist, white left wing people talk about class, but they exclude black people in that discourse. And what I would say is that what A. C. Vanandan challenged us to think he was the huge uh, 
thinker uh, of uh, um, the Institute of Race Relations and brought out a journal called Race and Class, that race and class can coexist in a complementary way, that they are not diametrically opposed to each other. They're not antagonists. Because if you look at the makeup of the class, black people are disproportionately represented in the working class, the most oppressed and the most militant in the workplace. And so that has to be considered. And I talk about that in the book. So there's been a rebalancing, a, a, a pivoting um, towards a, a looking at uh, empire insurgency and its importance, not just the Labour Party, Labourism, and uh, the Communist Party, but trying to use a wider canvas um, to look at the important issues um, through um, that optic. Uh, and I hope I've achieved that. Other changes to the book? Well, there's a preface now, which is like a new chapter of seven pages, where I connect the past with the present and talk about relevances. You know, going back a century, it's as if the clock dial hasn't moved much at all in terms of the issues that were important in Saklat Vala's day of uh, fighting imperialism, advancing uh, racial equality, uh, internationalism, socialism. How much further forward have we got? What is the position of women in our movement, of black women in our movement, and their huge importance? You know, these are burning questions that we have to have a discussion about and find resolution with our black sisters, with young people, the whole questions of the nature of the Labour Party, how relevant it is to the working class, black and white, male and female, able-bodied and disabled, uh, lesbian and gay. You know, these intersectional questions are tremendously important and will decide the future of the struggle. Nothing about us without us. We must be in the leadership of the fight back because unless that happens, what we'll be faced with is a demoralized working class that is not fit for the fight. And I think that's why Corbynism failed, because there was no vast mobilization. As Dahlia Gabrielle says, the black, wonderful young black scholar says, you know, where was this mobilizing of a social movement capable of keeping Jeremy Corbyn in office and getting him into government. There was a big mobilization, particularly among young people, but it wasn't sufficient to outnumber the gray vote because people over 40, 50, they're the bedrock of voters. They turn out in their millions and to counter what is sometimes their reactionary politics with radical politics needs a, a huge number of new voters coming into the system and supporting change. And that didn't happen in sufficient numbers. And that's why Corbynism, Corbynism failed. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so one of the major themes um, that you mentioned is um, decolonization. Um, can we talk a little bit about decolonization in the content in the context, sorry, of Shapaji Saklavala's la lifetime? And um, again, kind of looking at how far we've come in that process of decolonization, um, whether it be within schools, um, generally within, I guess, society, within our own sort of politics. Um, yeah. We have to remember that um, during the 1920s, a large swathe of the globe was under the British colonial yoke. You know, there was the mandate in 
um, Palestine. Churchill's role uh, I've re-examined in the book, where he turned out to be quite racist, frankly. You know, his role in the Bengal famine, where more than three million uh, Indians were starved to death. Uh, what he had to say about Indians, he said he hated Indians. And all of this has to be re-examined, honestly. I'm not saying it should be cut out of the history books, you know, the role of Churchill and, and people like him. But there needs to be the counter-argument, too, about the not-so-pleasant aspects to these um, so-called historical heroes' um, political careers. And that's why I'm so pleased that with the Black Lives Matter movement, we've seen... Uh, the tearing down of that white supremacist, racist, uh, slave trader Edward Colston's statue in Bristol, which for me was iconic. It was iconic to see that mainly white people actually were involved in that magnificent display and long overdue display of civil disobedience. And there's a now a whole argument about decolonizing the curriculum. You know, black students like yourself are quite rightly asking the question, why is my curriculum white? Why are most of my lecturers white? Even in African studies, in politics, in history. And we need to be raising those questions. We need to be raising questions about where institutions like Oriel College in Oxford gets its millions and millions of pounds from, from, from racist supremacists like Cecil Rhodes. And there was a big um, campaign, Roads Must Fall, to get his statue removed as well. So there's a conversation that's going on now that I think that Shapoji Saklat Vala would welcome. Um, it's about decolonization because colonization, racism, slavery, they have a way of morphing into different forms. And so they are still with us. And, and so I think that it's important that these themes are looked at uh, in my book in the context of what Shapoji Saklatvala had to say about them in his time. He raised the issue of Ireland and the need for um, Irish freedom and independence. He was a regular visitor to Ireland to support the cause, to support great uh, historical Irish figures like uh, James Larkin. There's a passage in the book where I talk about him in Dublin's main street, O'Connell Street, being feted by a crowd of more than 10,000 people who turned up to hear him speak as if he were some uh, pop star. And we remember the rallies of Jeremy Corbyn, don't we? When uh, thousands of young people turned out uh, to, to hear him. And yet this is a forgotten figure of colour who had a similar uh, uh, effect on people. He was a great orator, a passionate fighter uh, for the underdog and um, worked, you know, side by side with um, many great socialists of the time. And uh, incredible that a constituency, North Battersea, which was 99.9% .9 white would elect an Indian-born communist to the British Parliament in 1922. In fact, his supporters said, we thought we would storm heaven next. Thank you for that, Mark. So um, another theme that you discuss in the book is Sak Lavala's anti-imperialism activism. You quote that he was not opposed to Englishmen or women, but rather English capitalism, which was producing unemployment, underemployment in the homes of millions of British workers. Um, and I guess we can see parallels today um, in this sort of economic crisis, in this pandemic. Um, what does this tell us about anti-imperial activism in this contemporary age and how far things have come again or rather not evolved? Um, you mentioned in the beginning, you know, it's as though we've taken 10 steps back rather than, you know, 20 steps forward. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, well, I hope we all know 
what we're talking about when we say imperialism. We're talking about uh, the disproportionate power of the West. And now we just in the world have one superpower, which is America, as aided and abetted by Britain as a junior poodle partner, if you like, and others in uh, so-called NATO. And uh, we've seen the invasion of Iraq, the obliteration of that country and its na national heritages, um, of its people, more than 100,000 people murdered in the Iraq war, what happened in Libya, Afghanistan, similar massacres, bombed to pieces, completely unable to defend themselves. This isn't a war, it's a massacre. Cruise missiles costing millions of pounds each lobbed into those countries. Not conventional warfare, soldier against soldier on the ground. Obliteration. And then what's happening in Yemen right now, where the Saudis are slaughtering the Houthis because they're opposed uh, to them. And it's a sort of proxy war with Iran to do with the Shias uh, and the Sunni Muslims, when they should be one. And it's an international outrage. So imperialism is still with us and looming large. And frankly, I'm, I'm heartened that there are masses of people, young people particularly, like yourself, refusing to take this off the agenda and uh, demanding that uh, the world must be rebalanced. I'm from the global south, you're from the global south, we're actually the world majority and yet we've had all our resources stolen through slavery, we've had humans stolen tortured, maimed, raped, murdered, exploited for 400 years and more. And I argue for reparations, economic reparations in the book. That is an absolute necessity. And I think that could be done through um, the cancelling of so-called third world debt, uh, improved uh, uh, trading arrangements through um, the easing of tariffs, and frankly, trading with the global south. And we are going to see shortages of food, medicines, vital uh, products on the shelves, uh, queues going back miles of uh, container lorries trying to get onto the European continent from the 1st of January onwards. And it will be as big a crisis as the COVID pandemic, which, by the way, has disproportionately affected African, Caribbean, and Asian people on an industrial scale. We've been dying. 95% of doctors who died in the first phase of COVID, March and April this year, were Africa, Caribbean, and Asian. That's a stunning statistic. Why? Because they were put in the front line without proper uh, personal protection, but they didn't have the protection. And what does that tell you? And they were put in public facing jobs uh, where, you know, people are breathing over them and, uh, you know, it happened in the transport system. I'm thinking of Belly who died. She was a, a ticket um, uh, worker, ticket office worker at um, Victoria and was given COVID by a white male passenger and yet he's been tracked down and um, nothing's being done about prosecuting him. She died. It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. You look um, stunned. Um, overwhelmed really. Um, Overwhelmed, um, if I'm honest, but um, yeah, moving on, um, I guess. 
I wanted to talk um, about Saklavala's opposition to Gandhi's politics, um, because again, you know, there exist, I guess, different op opinions when it comes to Gandhi and his politics, um, particularly, you know, um, his non-violence. Um, let's talk a little bit about, I guess, Gandhi's politics and why Saklavala was in opposition of them and why he spoke out against Gandhi. The black Marxist CLR James, with the advantage of hindsight, had a clear view of who was right and who was wrong in this dispute over tactics. He wrote, Gandhi introduced a new dimension into the technique of mass struggle for national independence and perhaps for more. James described Gandhi's genius as one of the greatest of our time. What emerged from the Gandhi correspondence was that it was the Mahatma, not the comrade, who had a more sophisticated view of the Indian state. Saklatvala, like M. N. Roy, suffered in his political judgment as a result of having lived away from India for a long period. Saklatvala's revolutionary vanguard strategy could only have worked if the British colonial administration had been universally detested, and it was not. Some consent and much collaboration were the cornerstones of the Raj. So the system, contended Gandhi, could only be defeated by a complex network of non-cooperation. This was the gradualist approach loathed by socialist revolutionaries. By contrast, Saklavala envisaged a volcanic eruption of the working class which would destroy British rule. Okay, well, the great... Um, Cambridge scholar Priyam Vada Gopal, in her brilliant book, Insurgent Empire, talks about Saklatvala and um, in particular refers to my book in a very generous way and the way I had unearthed a correspondence between Saklatvala and Gandhi, a hot, fierce, dispute that they had over the tactics to be used in the Indian independence struggle. Gandhi, whom we're celebrating on the 151st anniversary of his birthday, believed in nonviolence. He believed that the British state, he knew that the British state was such a sophisticated highly militarized, armed to the teeth power, the greatest power at that time in the world, that it couldn't be defeated by the traditional Marxist tactics of an uprising among the industrial working class joined by the peasants. That wasn't the nature of the Indian population, the largest, second largest population in the world. They were mainly agrarian, agricultural peasants. And the notion of them trying to take on the British state through strikes, protests, uh, industrial mobilizations was pie in the sky. Some people say that Saklatval had been away from India too long to understand the nature of the population, which Gandhi understood very precisely. He said the best tactic would be to um, use non-cooperation. Uh, when the British wanted Indians to do their bidding, do their work, uh, they would spin cotton instead with the chaka, the spinning wheel. Hence that that is a symbol within the center of the Indian flag. And I use that on the front cover of my book. Through Swadeshi, self-help, buying Indian, not buying uh, British goods. And Gandhi, the Mahatma, was right and the comrade was wrong. And I say so in the book. So I'm critical of Sakhdatwala. I don't always support what he did. He made mistakes. He made mistakes over his attitude towards the Labour Party after the 1926 general strike. 
where he thought that it should be smashed, that it was the third capitalist force. He denounced the laborers, and he wrote to the communist leadership and urged them to take this ultra-left stance called the New Line, which was electorally disastrous. The Communist Party suffered its worst um, electoral uh, share of the vote of any time in its early history because of that class against class, as it was called, line. Because the reality is, in my view, in my humble view, we have to raise the consciousness of the working class. We can't be vanguardist. We can't say we know best and you should be in this position and you should be opposed to the Labour Party. Lenin had it totally correct when he said that we should work with the Labour Party as communists, but we should support them like a hangman's noose supports a condemned man. More importantly, we should point out that when it's right-wing leaders sell out the working class, we should point that out so that workers themselves make up their own minds that the party is no good and not for them, but not for us to lecture them and tell them how to think. And I think that very much transfers neatly across into the black struggle, that we have white leftists trying to tell us how to do the anti-racist struggle, when we should be in the leadership of it. We should be running our own struggle, welcoming genuine white allies, but not being told what to do by them. And that's the principle of black self-organization, black self-determination, black leadership that is so important. And that I applaud when I see militant black youth on the street, setting the agenda, joining the dots, making the connections, between not just Black Lives Matter, police brutality, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and others, but also talking about decolonizing the curriculum, talking about revolution, talking about fighting capitalism. And that's what makes the state and the elite and the status quo terrified. So I wanted to move on and discuss chapter six, titled Black Politics and Empire Insurgents, which refers to the politics of the Black British identity, namely African, African Caribbean, Indian Caribbean, South Asian and Chinese origin. Although Saklavala never explicitly referred to himself as Black, I wanted to touch upon the contemporary use of the term Black and what is known as political Blackness. Um, can we talk a little bit about the main distinctions, such as power and numbers in the 1970s, opposed to, I guess, today, um, creating space for various sections. Um, October is always Black History Month, um, but Black History is, is you know, it's that there shouldn't just be a month. It's, it's every day. We should be celebrating one another daily. We should be sort of, again, linking back to decolonization and um while curriculum is so white um yeah i want to talk about i guess the prejudices that have evolved within our communities in particular um you don't explicitly refer to saklavala as black um but i know during the 1970s and during the um in the consensus those who were not white were referred to as black um by default yes well, language evolves. Um, we follow maybe the teachings of that uh, great linguist, Noam Chomsky. Uh, words don't hold the same meaning. Um, in Sakratvala's day, he was insulted uh, by rival politicians and called the black man. He would have referred to himself as colored. Certainly he brought greetings from the colored world to the Pan-Africanist Congress, the Pan-Africanist Conference in London that um, John Archer, the Pan-Africanist and mayor of Battersea as a black man in 1913, introduced him to. So he knew that he wasn't white. He knew that the majority of the world in 
the global south aren't white and they're the most oppressed. And he was a champion of their causes. So there has been an evolution. Uh, I remember in the 70s and 80s when I was campaigning at the very beginning uh, that we had this term, as you said, political black. And that uh, embraced all people of color, the term that is now used, who experienced discrimination based on the color of our skin. So that meant Asian people, uh, South Asian, uh, Chinese, African Caribbean, African Caribbean, Pacific Islanders, all embraced. And as you indicated, it gave us a critical mass in terms of campaigning. Because if you look at the demographics, people of Indian descent, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, they are four times more numerous in the population than African Caribbean. When I was growing up, uh, people of African Caribbean descent largely came from the Caribbean, mainly Jamaica. But if you look at the demographic now, people from continental Africa, quote unquote Africans, are larger as a proportion in the population than Caribbeans. Did you know that? You are in the majority when it comes to us. Rawan has a Sudanese sister. And we have to look at those issues, embrace them play to the strengths of those demographics and not be divided because we face a common enemy and that's called racism. So I wanted to be a little bit critical of the book as be well. Be as critical as you like. Refer to the lack of reference um, to women, particularly black women's plight and the history of black women's grassroots organizing during Saklavala's time. Um, Let's talk a bit more about that, um, because again, there is sort of that in general lack of acknowledgement of black women's grassroots organizing, black women sort of being behind particular um, figures um, and the work and I guess our plight in general. Um, yeah. Well, I'm pleased for that question, because I think every man has to confront his sexism all men are sexist all white people are racist and it's not a matter of whether they are or they aren't but what are they doing about it and i have actively tried in the book um to confront that um sally uh, sakletvala who uh, became known as seri um sakletvala's wife i have spent time developing her character and describing her family and her life more in this edition of the book than I did last time. And that was a conscious effort. Uh, I talk about Charlotte Despard, a great uh, heroine uh, in Battersea, who was a Sinn Féiner, a supporter of Irish liberation and a suffragette. And she was the candidate for the Labour Party uh, uh, for North Battersea before Sakhalakvala. And there's a lovely photo of her with him uh, as part of the 27 photographs that uh, I have put in the book. Um, there are the Pankhursts, Emmeline and Sylvia, uh, that are mentioned. And Sakhletvala worked with them on the issue of women's suffrage. I have to say that as far as my research goes, as far as my scholarship goes, I couldn't find many black women. There's Amy. Garvey, of course, from that period, and the huge role that she played. But she was mainly based in America. She wasn't in Britain uh, fighting. Um, and so there's a dearth, really, of examples for me to, to draw on. But where I possibly could, I've included the voices of black women. I talk about Olive Morris. I talk about Jaya Ben Desai who led the Grunwick dispute, 
the magnificent role of Asian workers, largely women, who were involved in the Mansfield hosiery mills, imperial typewriter struggles, the Indian Workers Association, a socialist organization that had lots of women in it in its heyday. Um, and I quote the black scholar, Dahlia Gabriel, in my conclusions, and think that she is an important voice and is going to be an important um, uh, thought leader of the future, an intellectual. So I've tried as, as hard as I can, and I give you a commitment uh, that I'll try even harder as a result of knowing a magnificent uh, black woman, young black woman like you. For my final question, I wanted to talk about Jeremy Corbyn and his time in the Labour Party. Um, I also wanted to draw upon, I guess, the Labour Party's um, imperial involvement um, and what Saklavala would have made of that? Well, there are parallels for Jeremy Corbyn. Clearly he was a, well, is a radical socialist like Saklavala. He's not a communist. And we have to remember that uh, Saklavala uh, stood three times as a Labour candidate in 1922, 1923, 1924 even though he was an avowed communist. So he never hid the fact that he was a member of the Communist Party. But he stood as a Labour candidate in all of those three elections, supported by the Battersea Trades Council and Labour Party. It was only in 1929 that he stood just as a communist candidate. And at that point, the Battersea Labour Party had moved so far to the right that it was actually standing a Labour candidate against him, William Saunders. So there's a lot of confusion around Saklavala and what party he stood for in elections. He always stood for the Labour Party, but as an open communist. So you could say he was always the communist candidate, or you could say he was always the Labour candidate. Take your pick. But you can't say that he was a uh, communist in uh, 1923 and 1924. You'd have to say he was solely communist in 1929. I hope that's not nitpicking. It's actually an, quite an important distinction. Comparisons with Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn is not a communist. I remember when his brother, Piers, I saw him at an Extinction Rebellion demo in Trafalgar Square. I go on a lot of demos. And um, I said to Piers, um, how would you describe your brother's politics? And he said, well, I'm a communist. He's not a communist. He's always had a rather touching affection for the Labour Party. So Jeremy was about as radical as you can get within the confines of what <laughs> Sacklet Vala rather dismissively described as the liberals, like a mixture between liberal and labor. And don't forget the working class was voting for the liberals up until 1900, because there was no labor party until 1900. And the labor party, as Tony Benn once said, my friend, is a party with socialists in it. It's not a socialist party, never has been. And in my view, I don't think ever will be. But Jeremy Corbyn was a socialist and an internationalist. Pro-Palestinian rights, very important part of his political architecture. He's always had a rather touching affection for the Labour Party. So Jeremy was about as radical as you can get within the confines of what <laughs> Sacklet Vala rather dismissively described as the liberals, like a mixture between liberal and labor. And don't forget the working class was voting for the liberals up until 1900, because there was no labor party until 1900. And the labor party, as Tony Benn once said, my friend, is a party with socialists in it. It's not a socialist party, 
never has been, and in my view, I don't think ever will be. But Jeremy Corbyn was a socialist and an internationalist, pro-Palestinian rights, very important part of his political architecture. But he had to suppress that, he felt. Didn't hear him really speaking out on Palestine, on Syria, or what was happening in Iraq, Libya. He turned down the volume. And as I quote Tarek Ali in my book saying, he should have fought his opponent. He might have lost, but he could have put up a good fight and he didn't. Instead, he appeased, he apologized, and he capitulated. And in my consideration, that was a big mistake. Saklat Vala wouldn't have done that. He was a man of principle. He was uncompromising. And I think that when we look back on the uh, Corbyn project and its legacy, we have to do some serious self-examination and self-criticism of where we went wrong. We went wrong on Brexit. You know, failing to stick to what we did in 2017 at the 2017 election and supported the referendum result, whether we liked it or not. To try and triangulate, muddy the waters, talk about a second referendum, it lost us swathes of seats in the north among the white working class. We do need a socialist government in this world. We need a socialist world. We need an anti-imperialist, internationalist world. Podemos in Spain, there are examples, Syria is in Greece. There are little eruptions and then Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, Occupy. These are fantastic extra parliamentary movements that have the opportunity to bring back insurgency and reclaim the Labour Party from outside industrial strikes, that sort of thing, uh, and, um, you know, get rid of the right wing. Or maybe have a new party. If we got proportional representation in this country, I reckon we could get between six, seven, eight, maybe 10% of the vote. That would put 40 or 50 socialist MPs, probably looking like us, several of them, and women, many women, I hope, into parliament. And that's what I would like to see. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um, so now Mark is going to do a reading of chapter three, Bolshevik Battersea's Tribune of People. When you're ready, Mark. <laughs> all of it. You don't want all of it, do you? <laughs> yeah. Well, why an Indian? and a member of the Communist Party came to be elected as a Labour MP for North Battersea in 1922 needs some explanation. And that's an understatement. Shaklavala's rise to national prominence within the radical independent Labour Party has already been discussed. But a major part of the answer lies in the nature of the constituency itself. At that time, North Battersea comprised four wards, church, Latchmere, Nine Elms, where the US Embassy is now grotesquely based, and Park. It took in the whole of Battersea Park with Clapham Junction on the southwestern border, two and a half miles of land upstream along the south side of the River Thames from the Houses of Parliament. The area's socialist rejection of British imperialism was not immediately apparent. There were several colonial collections, nonetheless, in Latchmere, roads named Khyber, Afghan and Kabul could confuse the casual observer. But for 36 years, before Saklat Vala was selected as the constituency's parliamentary candidate, the place had been in the forefront of radical British politics. The Times described it as one of the chief centres of the socialist and communist movements what a fabulous place red battersea yes i'll have some of that bolshe battersea the newspapers used to call it uh, bolshe standing for bolshevik you know the russian soviet mm -hmm. union they raised the red flag above the town hall 
They refused to celebrate Empire Day. They supported the Boers against the British in the Boers War. And had one of their leaders as a speaker at political rallies. It was a revolutionary hub with an Indian born communist MP. How fabulous is that? The, the, the leadership of the National Unemployed Movement. Wal Hannington came from Battersea. Uh, John Burns, who'd been the socialist MP before Sakharov Vala, had been a major player in the great strike, national strike. You know, it was a hotbed of um, activists during the 1926 general strike when Sakharov Vala was um, jailed in Wormwood Scrubs prison for two months for a speech he gave in support of the striking miners. What a wonderful place to be. It reminds me of Lambeth in the early 1980s, where I was a prominent uh, left-wing and black activist when we were fighting Margaret Thatcher over the poll tax and um, uh, attacks on um, local government, um, rate capping. And we had a leader there who was a good friend of mine, Ted Knight, and he was dubbed by the gutter press as Red Ted. Not far away from Battersea, but, um, you know, I can imagine what energy and what sort of electric politics was going on there. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember it had a large Irish descended population, more than 90% of the population were descended from Ireland. And that's one of the reasons why Sakhalat Vala took up the cudgels on behalf of the Irish people so strongly. And that's a, another important new section of the book where I talk about that political work that he did. So Mark, uh, would you like to tell everyone with us today where they can purchase the book? The best place to get hold of Comrade Sack is from People Tree Press. Go on their website, click on my book, and at some point you will see a tab that says purchase at the very reasonable price of $14.99. People Tree have a pile of these books ready for dispatch to you today. Go out and buy the book. So if you're interested, the book is available on www.peopletreepress.com slash Comrade Sack. Um, that's C-O-M-R-A-D-E-S-A-K. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for agreeing to do this, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Um, solidarity always. Uh, and I hope um, we can do this again and I hope to speak to you soon.